You're about to order lunch when you hear a commotion behind you. You turn around and see a man standing on top of a dumpster, yelling, throwing things at people. Two police officers are telling him to get off the dumpster. He ignores them, and one of the officers shoots the man with a taser. You watch as he tumbles off the dumpster, face first, onto the sidewalk. You're listening to 911 Cast, the no nonsense EMS podcast. This episode is brought to you by Madison Programs, a Brooklyn based medical training and consulting company with over 20 years of experience specializing in emergency medical continuing education and AHA certification classes like CPR and first aid for community members and professionals. For more information, email madisonprograms at aol.com. I'm Scott Topiel, and this week, It's all about electrical injuries. From our phones to our cars, it seems that everything today runs on electricity. It's so ubiquitous that sometimes we don't treat it with the respect it deserves. Each day, there are countless near misses. A bare wire touched by a child, a careless amateur electrician that shorts a circuit and trips the breaker. But sometimes these electrical misadventures are more serious. Each year, about 3,000 people in the United States are admitted to burn centers because of electrical injuries, and about 1,000 people die. Now, it might sound obvious, but before attempting to help an electrocution victim, you need to first make sure the power source is turned off. This could be as simple as disconnecting the main breaker to a house or more complicated, such as requesting the electric company to cut power to a downed wire that's lying on top of a car. Also, be careful when water is involved. Several years ago in Los Angeles, two good Samaritans tried to help a driver that had crashed his car into a power pole and sheared a fire hydrant. They were both killed when they stepped into the water and were electrocuted. There are two types of electrical current, direct current, known as DC, and alternating current, known as AC. DC means that electricity runs in one direction. This is common in battery-operated devices and also the type of current delivered by a lightning strike. AC, as its name implies, is electricity that alternates directions. This is the type of current delivered by an electrical outlet in your home. In the United States, household AC current cycles 60 times per second, meaning it changes direction at a frequency of 60 hertz. Knowing the type of current is important because DC and AC injury patterns can be quite different. DC contact tends to be shorter in duration, but more violent, with victims often being thrown due to its tendency to generate a single large muscle spasm. This means the likelihood of other trauma occurring together with the electrical injury is high. On the other hand, AC causes repeated muscle stimulation as it moves back and forth. This can cause the victim to involuntarily grasp the electrical source, leading to them staying in contact with the electricity longer. Electricity is also classified as either high voltage or low voltage. High voltage is anything over 1,000 volts. This means a standard 120 volt outlet is considered low voltage compared to the more than 100,000 volts that might be carried through a high tension power line. The most important factor in electrical injury is the amount of current measured in amps. It might help to think of voltage as being synonymous with pressure and current with speed. The more current, the faster the electricity moves. The faster the current, the greater the injury. So a person that comes into contact with, say, 120 volts at a mere 1 milliamp probably won't even notice it. Increase the current to just 3 milliamps, and they'll start to feel some tingling. Turn it up to 10 milliamps, and pain kicks in. At 100 milliamps, they're likely to develop ventricular fibrillation and cardiac arrest. Electrical contact can cause injury three different ways, through the direct effects of the electricity itself, as a result of burns caused by the heat generated as electricity moves through the body, and as a result of secondary injuries caused by muscle contractions, blasts from lightning strikes, or simply by falling. So don't forget to consider the need for spinal motion restriction. The heart is highly sensitive to electrical disturbances, so dysrhythmia is a real concern. Electricity can throw someone into cardiac arrest, with ventricular fibrillation being the most common fatal arrhythmia. Interestingly, some patients that experience asystolic cardiac arrest as a result of an electrical exposure will spontaneously return to sinus rhythm. 
But electricity doesn't only affect the heart, it also affects other muscles, including the ones we use to breathe. So, a patient whose heart restarts on its own after being shocked might experience respiratory paralysis that lasts longer. Unless their airway is secured and ventilation is provided, they'll eventually go into V-fib arrest and die. After ensuring that immediate life threats are addressed, prioritize obtaining a 12-lead EKG. Look for any abnormal findings and provide continuous cardiac monitoring during transport. In most cases, if the initial EKG is normal, the likelihood of the patient developing a dysrhythmia is low, but it can still occur. If you arrive to find the patient in cardiac arrest, treat them using your standard ACLS protocols. In cardiac arrest caused by electricity, consider prolonged resuscitation, even if the initial rhythm is asystole. Good outcomes are possible, especially when the victim is young. If you encounter multiple victims, such as in the case of a lightning strike, Consider reversing your triage and treating those without signs of life first. Electricity can also cause neurological symptoms. Common findings include loss of consciousness, weakness, paralysis, or autonomic dysfunction, a dangerous condition that involves the parts of the central nervous system that are responsible for regulating basic functions like blood pressure, heart function, and breathing. And don't forget about musculoskeletal injuries. Look for fractures or dislocations that may have been caused by the person falling after they were shocked. Even if they didn't fall, fractures can happen when the electricity causes muscles to contract strongly. Since electricity creates heat as it travels, burns are common. You'll treat electrical burns the same way you would treat any other burn. But keep one thing in mind. The external burn that you see does not give any indication of how much internal damage has been done. A small electrical burn on the hand might not look like a big deal, but under the surface there could be catastrophic injuries like total coagulation of muscles or necrosis of internal organs. This also complicates your IV fluid resuscitation. Standard fluid calculations like the Parkland formula can't be used to determine how much fluid to give an electrical burn. This is because they rely on knowing the amount of body surface area that's been affected. Electrical burns aren't visible, and the external injuries tend to underestimate the amount of internal burns. In the hospital, the patient's urine output and kidney function will be used to titrate their fluids. In the field, follow your specific protocols for electrical injuries. Young children often chew or suck on electrical cords. This can cause an electrical burn to the corner of the mouth, a scab will form at this spot, and when it comes off, up to two weeks later, severe bleeding can occur from the labial artery. If you encounter this, be sure to control it with direct pressure, as this bleeding can become life-threatening. Then there are conducted electrical weapons like stun guns and tasers. These are used commonly by law enforcement and the general public. A typical weapon of this type might deliver as much as 50,000 volts of DC current at about 2 milliamps in short pulses lasting about 100 milliseconds each. The brief duration of these pulses, along with their very low current, spares the recipient of the dangerous effects of high voltage electricity while providing a near total loss of voluntary muscle control. Most sources report that the risk of cardiac arrhythmia or death from these types of weapons is minuscule. So, if a patient is asymptomatic after being stunned or tased, and they have a normal 12 lead EKG, there's very little risk of electrical injury. So why then do you read stories about people dying after getting tased? Simple. They usually sustain some other injury. While the electricity delivered by the weapon might not be dangerous, the fall sure can be. That brings us back to your interrupted lunch break. After the officers secure the scene, they ask you to evaluate their suspect. While you're not all that concerned about an electrical injury, you are worried about other problems the most obvious being head trauma from his face-first fall from the dumpster. Your patient's awake, but seems altered, and smells of alcohol. Your partner maintains spinal motion restriction, and you place a C-collar on him. You also provide high-flow oxygen for the isolated head trauma. A 12-lead EKG doesn't show anything unusual, and his blood sugar is normal. You tell the officers that their suspect needs to be transported to the hospital to check for head and spinal injuries. Two taser barbs are still embedded in the patient's skin, but your local protocols don't allow you to remove them. 
While most electrical exposures are minor, some can be fatal. Always ensure that the electrical source has been shut off before approaching an electrical victim and address immediate life threats such as cardiac or respiratory arrest. Consider prolonged resuscitation, even in the case of asystole, and remember to check for other trauma. That's it for this episode of 911 Cast. We'd like to thank our founding sponsor, OneKit, makers of high quality first aid kits. Check out their products at buyonekit.com. That's B U Y O N E kit.com. Until next time, thanks for listening.